Father in heaven, we thank you so very much that you are a God who is faithful. Amen. And Lord, as we're going to look at here a little bit in this presentation, we want to live by faith and not feeling. And I know in my own life that so many times I am ruled by my feelings. Lord, you would, you would long for our feelings to align with our faith, but that's not always the case. It doesn't always happen. And so, F Father, we stand upon the sure word. We stand upon your promises. We stand upon your grace, knowing that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Amen. So we praise you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some of you have no doubt heard of Albert Einstein, a gentleman who is uh, somewhat famous. I'm saying that a little sarcastically, of course. But Albert Einstein was one of the most brilliant minds, if not the most brilliant mind, of the 20th century. And he uh, made discoveries that I can't even comprehend. In fact, uh, my latest book, I tell the story in it, and um, one of my favorite persons in the world who, who uh, was a professor of mine at, at Andrews University and who had been reading the book, I, I talk about Einstein in there and I say, I don't even remember which part it was I said, he discovered or he unearthed the theory of special relativity. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Am I say, even saying it the right way? Because my, my good friend, Lael Caesar, he emailed me and he said, by the way, it's not the special theory of relativity, it's the theory of special relativity. Now, which one is the right one? Does anyone know? We have any smart people here? Well, we don't know. Okay. So anyway, I, I can't even comprehend some of these ideas that he was able to unearth and to explain. So he was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientist, a phys physicist, a theoretical physicist. But what is maybe not quite as well known is that Albert Einstein was actually a very, very accomplished violinist. He was a very accomplished violinist. I am, I am at least half of that. I am, well, I'm not even really anymore, but I am a violinist. I used to be in a former life. I was raised playing the violin. And uh, I identify actually with what part of Albert Einstein's experience was because you see, when he was a child, he hated to play the violin. And more specifically, he hated to practice the violin. Any of you play any instruments ever before? All right. How many of you just loved to practice? Anybody here? All right. Look at that. Praise the Lord. Okay. Some of you did. A few of you did. But uh, he hated to practice the violin. Actually, it's, it's rather interesting because um, probably many of you know that Elder Robert Whelan was a violinist. You, you knew that, perhaps? And my, actually, the first time I ever met him, he was staying in our home. I was probably seven or eight years old. He was staying in our home, and he discovered that I played the violin. And I'll never forget, after he went home, he sent me a CD with some beautiful violin music. So that was a very precious uh, experience for me. But, but Einstein did not enjoy practicing, no matter what his mother did. You know, these, you know this experience, right? No matter what his mother did, he did not want to practice. No matter how much bribing he would, she would do, no matter how much cajoling she would do, no matter what she did, he would not practice. Until one day, he was walking through a room, and through the air, he heard something. What did he hear? Mozart sonatas. Mozart sonatas. Mozart sonatas. And he fell in love right then and there. And he started to practice and practice and practice. He had fallen in love with the violin because he heard the beautiful melodies of Mozart sonatas. He was later reflecting on that experience and he came up with an interesting observation. Notice what he said. He said, I believe love is a better teacher than a sense of duty. Amen. 
Love is a better teacher than a sense of duty. Have you found that to be your experience? Have you found in your Christian walk that you have tried over and over and over and over again out of a sense of duty only to have complete failure because you cannot sustain your obedience based on the sense of duty? I know there's many people who have experienced that and I have in my own life. When you do something out of a sense of duty, some of us are either blessed or cursed, I'm not sure which one it is, blessed or cursed with a strong willpower. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so we are very, very dedicated. We have a strong work ethic and so we can get it done because that's who we are as far as our personality. Now those types of people, and no offense to any of you who might be like that, but those types of people can somewhat be uh, challenging to be around, right? There's a lot of pride that goes into it. There's, there's a lot of self that, that comes out because, hey, I did it. You should be able to do it as well, right? Some of those people are kind of miserable to be around because they have done it in their own strength. They have done it in their own strength. And I want to assure you that doing the obedience thing out of a sense of duty can only last so long. It's a dead-end street. Ellen White says, and I don't have this quote here, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, to serve God merely from a, how does the quote go? Sense of duty? No, she says, to serve God merely out of hope of reward or fear of hell avails nothing. Avails nothing. It's a dead end street. And so if we are pursuing the Christian walk from a sense of duty, which, was a, which is what a lot of people have experienced, it is a dead-end street. I want to invite you to open the pages of your Bibles this afternoon to Matthew chapter 13 because I want to look at a little parable that to me is a little taste of Mozart, Mozart's sonata. Matthew chapter 13 and a lot of times when I preach messages, I preach because it speaks to my own soul. Is that okay? Can I be a little selfish in my preaching? I figure if, if something does not work for me, I can't preach it to you and suppose it's going to work for you. Okay? So, so these, what I'm, what I'm sharing here in my few presentations very much speak to my own soul. And they very much have worked in my own experience. And so I want to share of the overflow with you. I've gone to this passage so many times that it's even ripped out of my Bible. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We know these parables starting in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like what? Treasure. Treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and does what? He buys the field. Continuing on, Jesus now further elaborates on this general concept. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now we rightfully so, very, very rightfully so, note how these parables point to us to the cost that Christ has given us in order to follow him. Right? You see, and, and, and some of us maybe are a little hesitant to emphasize this sort of message. Those of us especially who have, who have, who have come upon the beautiful news of the gospel of the 1888 message especially. We don't, we don't want to talk a lot about the cost to follow Jesus. We don't want to talk about the cost to be his disciple because we believe, rightfully so, that the good news is so beautiful that we will not even consider it much of a cost, right? Amen. And yet the reality is, is that not every moment of every day is hunky-dory. And, and we don't want to give people the impression that every moment of their life will just be this, this overriding sense of joy and delight. And you know, you know I, I know I'm being a little, I'm walking on thin ice here, but I remember having a conversation with a good friend of mine in college. 
And he was really, really struggling with his faith. And we were freshmen at Andrews University. And I was kind of explaining to him the beautiful news of the gospel and how, how as we're going to unpack here a little bit more, how when we take on the yoke of Christ, duty becomes a delight, right? That's what Ellen White says. And that's what we've experienced as well. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? And so some of us, and, I, and I've had these conversations where people say, well, wait a minute, you're making it sound too easy, right? You're making it sound too easy. And I first of all say, well, who said it has to be hard? Who says it has to be hard? But we sometimes give the impression that every single moment of every single day is going to be this overriding joy and it's just going to, we're always going to be happy and we're never going to come up where our will is crossed when God asks us to do something. And, you, and we got to read the Gospels, really. How many times did people come up to Jesus and, and he said, well, you're going to have to count the cost. You're going to have to count the cost. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many people turned away because of that. And he looks at the disciples and what does he say to them? Are you going to go away too? Are you going to go away too? Or the rich young ruler comes up to him and he says, hey, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I so want to jump into the story and I want to say, Jesus, just make it really easy for him. Make it really easy for him. I mean, he has a lot of money after all. He could be a, really, a real asset to the cause, right? Jesus, make it really easy for him. And Jesus, the gospel writers record, looked at him and he loved him, right? Or it's just not even going to work, is it? <laughs> The Gospel writers record that Jesus looked at him and loving him and then he explained to him what the cost was going to be. And the young man turns away and what? He leaves because he had great possessions. And I, again, I so want to jump into the story and say, Jesus, you made it too hard for him. But the reality is when Christ, as the, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Come and die. Come and die. You know, we, we partly find ourselves in a position as, as we do as a church because as someone has said recently that I read, we have allowed people to become Christians without becoming followers of Jesus. You can be a Christian and not be a follower of Jesus. You can come to the faith and yet not be a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to have to count the cost. But here's the awesome thing. Ellen White is very clear to us. When we get to heaven and we look at all the glories of heaven and we look back at the things we went through, we are going to say, what is it that we're going to say? Heaven was, is cheap enough. Heaven is cheap enough. So Christ calls us to come and die. Christ calls us to give up all if we're going to follow Him. And so we do need to call, count the cost. We do need to recognize the high price of the gospel. But even still, when, when we look back on it, we're going to say, man, that was nothing compared to the rich, glorious experience I'm having with Christ my Savior for all eternity. For all eternity. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is a gospel that stops there as well, isn't there? There's a gospel that stops there. There's a gospel there that places all the emphasis on, on man. All the emphasis on what I give up. All the emphasis on what I do. All the emphasis on the cost and the price that I pay. And Jesus says, wait a minute, there's another side to the coin here. Because I cannot pay the cost if I do not first recognize the cost that has been paid for me. Amen. Now notice what Jesus goes on to say in this parable. I've got to take out my page here. Notice what Jesus goes on to say in the parable. Again, it says in verse 44, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the message is, you know, Jesus is inviting us to give up all, to die to self, to surrender over to him, to die daily. But he does not ask 
of us that which he does not do himself. Amen. Because notice the next parable, and, I, and it was like a light was turned on the first time I came across this, and many of you probably learned this long ago, but I'm a slow learner. It says in verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a what? Is like a what? It's like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Notice, what is the kingdom like in the first parable? Treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like the treasure, that which is being sought. So it is us seeking after the riches of heaven, us seeking after the great God of heaven. But the second parable says the kingdom of heaven is like what? So the roles are reversed, aren't they? The roles are reversed. The first parable is about us seeking after heaven. The second parable is about heaven seeking after us. The first parable is about us giving up all for God. The second parable is about God giving up all for us. The first time I saw that, I my mind was blown and my heart was just enraptured with the love that God has for me. Because that's what the parable says, that the merchant seeking beautiful pearls, when he had found that one pearl of great price, what does he do? He went and sold all that he had. And I love Man, thank you, Bob. Two nights ago. I love that idea. That, that God gave up the only thing that he could not recreate. That's a powerful thought. God gave up the one thing that he could not recreate. And that was his own son. And when he sent him to, to live, to be born, to live and to die on our behalf, it was not simply a little loan that he was giving. It was a gift that he was giving that will have eternal and does have eternal consequences. So Jesus gave up all for you and for me. And so the question that I grappled with was in light of this reality what does that say about me what does that say about me what does that say about you what does that say about us as a corporate body what estimation has God placed upon us that he would be willing to give up the most precious commodity in the universe for us you're familiar with these quotations, no doubt, but we're going to rattle them off here. Ellen White says, Christ, the heavenly merchant men seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of price. The pearl of price. In man, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. Hearts that have been the battleground of conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of love are more precious to the Redeemer than those who have never fallen. Now that's a mind-blowing statement right there in and of itself. And we could spend, and we will spend, eternity contemplating the implications of such a thought. How could that possibly be? How could it possibly be that God, it says, finds us more precious than those who have never fallen. And all I would say is, God's love is attracted to helplessness. I mean, those of us who have children, boy, my heart... I remember a year or so ago, I was out playing hide-and-go-seek with my son at nighttime. And my son is the, the typical firstborn child. Very alpha right? He's in charge. He doesn't need anything. He's going to take care of it all. And we were playing hide and seek and it was at night. It was just outside in our, our driveway. And uh, I went and hid off in a corner, very dark. And we live in a pretty busy neighborhood. And uh, for a second he didn't know where I was and he couldn't figure out if I was still out there. And he started crying and calling for me. Where are you, Daddy? Where are you? And so I very quickly, well, first I didn't know if he was just trying to play me, you know? 
<laughs> but I decided to reveal myself and he came running up to me and you know flung his arms around me you know what the funny thing is though my heart was so much endeared to him yep. and it was because of his helplessness and so our our condition is the exact thing that endears us to God and why he finds us so precious to him and so he looks at us and he sees great value and we're more precious to him than those who have never fallen God looked upon humanity not as vile and worthless he looked upon it in Christ saw it as it might become through redeeming love he collected all the riches of the universe and did what laid them down in order to buy the pearl I kind of brought this idea out a little bit last night but I very soberingly and poignantly came to the realization that a major problem in my life is that I have not understood the value I have to God yeah. and there are many people here who have that same problem now I might dare say that women may be a little more aware of this than us men because us guys we're not as in touch with our feelings we're not as emotional we're pretty self sufficient but we do the same things men we do the same things we find our value so frequently in external things the car the house the degree the job promotion and God says well hold on time out here your value is not based on those things and I've, I've just singling men out here for a second but women it's the same thing the clothes the friends the whatever it is your value is not based on those things your value is based upon the estimation that God has placed on you our value can be seen and is revealed on the cross of Calvary and I have to keep coming back to that I have to keep coming back to that that I am greatly beloved that I am accepted in Jesus that I am a child of God that that by virtue of the fact that he has created me I am his child and so I am precious to him I am valuable to him and here's the thing everybody else is as well Amen. she goes on to say this is another signs of the times January 16 1893 we are his purchased property bought at an infinite price would you know the manner of love that has been bestowed upon you I point you to the cross of Calvary very simple exercise what how do you determine the value of any particular thing how is how is value determined in a free market it's based upon what a person is willing to pay for it and so check this out if God was willing to exchange his son for us what does that mean we are worth mm -hmm. it means we're worth his son no less than his son now I'm I've never fully committed to this idea but I just in the basic economics it seems like it would make sense when you actually purchase something you that necessarily implies that you value the thing you're acquiring more than the thing you're parting with right mm -hmm. now I'm afraid to go there mm -hmm. I'm afraid to go there but using that model it would almost seem and again you can correct me for heresy somebody needs to correct me but if if God gave up his son in exchange for us what does that say about our value to God 
She goes on to say, at the very least, it means we're as valuable to him as we are his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ died in behalf of the world. Our heavenly Father has valued us at the price of Jesus. Amen. And so I have to go back there again and again and again and again and again to realize my belovedness. You know, it's rather interesting because some of you are on Twitter like I am. Amen? <laughs> Let's not down Twitter at all, all right? None of you were, but it's amazing how many people I have met and connected with in my city just based on Twitter. And, and I have... I've become really, really good friends with people in my city after meeting them on Twitter, like the mayor of, of, my, of my city. And now we're really, really good friends. We met each other on Twitter. But anyway, that's not, that, I'm not promoting Twitter. Um, they're not paying me to promote them. But anyway, so you have a little thing where you can describe who you are, right? And I always used to put this quotation from Romans chapter 7. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's who I am. That's, 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 I sense my need. I sense my helplessness. And, and I wanted that to be what people knew about me. That this is who I am. This is who I am. I am a wretched man. I am in need of, of rescuing. I am in need of somebody else to rescue me. And then, for some reason, I started to really appreciate my belovedness. And it may seem like a very simple thing. But Bob's probably looking right now. What does my Twitter handle say now? Maybe he's not. This is my, my handle. Beloved of God. Amen. Beloved of God. That's who I am. I am beloved of God. That's who you are. Amen. You are a precious, precious, valuable child of God. And we have to keep coming back to that message and my spiritual life rises and falls on my understanding of my belovedness in Jesus. She goes on to say this, the value of a soul who can estimate? Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish when he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ did what? Risk. Christ risked all. And he really, truly did risk all. That's not just a platitude. That's not just something she's throwing out there. Christ risked all for our redemption. Now check this out. Heaven itself was imperiled. Just as a little side note. What I was always intrigued by, you know the story of the lost sheep in Luke 15? There was, there was this part of the story that I never quite understood. You remember how the sheep is lost and, the, and so the shepherd leaves the 99 where? Where? Where, where does the shepherd leave the 99? In the what? We better go there. Okay, let's go there. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine... In the wilderness. Where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness. In the wilderness. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And I always used to read that passage and I would think to myself, well, why in the world would the 99 be left in the wilderness and not be brought back to the fold, to, the, to, to where there is safety and, and protection, right? 
Now, it's interesting because if you read uh, these little like Uncle Arthur uh, Bible stories, I was, I was reading it one day to my children, and I'm reading along, and that story has the sheep in the fold when the shepherd goes out and looks for them. And I guess I just needed a visual because I read it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not right. That's not how the story goes. And then all of a sudden, clicked with me. It clicked with me. Thank you. It clicked with me. <laughs> it clicked with me. I won't click again. Because how does the parable end? And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And I'm thinking, well, hold on here. What type of other human beings don't need to repent? Like, are there, are there human beings here that don't need to repent? And then it, it dawned on me, Jesus is not talking about us as individuals here. It's beautiful that we think of that, and that's a part of the gospel message. But Jesus is talking about us as a lost planet. Ellen White brings the statement out. I don't remember exactly where it is. But she brings the statement out that the one lost sheep is this lost planet. And so who are the other 99? The universe, the unfallen planets. And so check this out. When Jesus was sent on his rescue mission, Ellen White says heaven itself was imperiled. imperiled. What would have happened if the rescue mission had not gone as planned? The whole universe would have been sent into disarray. And so the 99 were left in the wilderness. The 99 were left without the protection and safety. They were themselves at risk because of what Jesus did for us. So the whole universe was at risk. And God was willing to pay that price for our redemption. How much, again, are you and I worth? Remember that Christ risked all for our redemption. Heaven itself was imperiled at the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life. You may estimate the value of a soul. Now, we might be tempted to stop there in the quotation. But we have no such liberty. Because there are missiological implications for this idea. And, and Fred and I were just talking about this during our little visit here. Well, I was wanting to listen to Ron, but that's all right, Fred. <laughs> he was too, I think. Um, you see, all these beautiful truths that we, we, we put our arms around, they are supposed to not only do something to us, they are supposed to do something through us. What God has done to us, He is seeking to do through us. So the truth that I, I come to discover by God's grace about my value must necessarily have implications for how I look at other people and how I interact with other people. And if Christ risked all for me, what how will that manifest itself in my own life towards other people? Notice what she goes on to say. If you are in communion with Christ, you will place His estimate upon every human being. Yes. You will feel for the others the same deep love that Christ has felt for you. Then you will be able to win, not drive, to attract, not repulse those for whom he died. None would ever have been brought back to God if Christ had not made a personal effort for them. And it is by this personal work that we can rescue souls. When you see those who are going down to death, you will not rest in quiet indifference and ease. The greater their sin, 
and the deeper their misery, the more earnest and tender will be your efforts for their recovery. You will discern the need of those who are suffering, who have been sinning against God, and who are oppressed with a burden of guilt. Your heart will go out in sympathy for them, and you will reach out to them a helping hand. By the way, just as a side note, I love how she's putting this in descriptive terminology. She's not saying, hey, by the way, you better come up with this sympathy for people. You better come up with this, this desire to go out and reach out to them. She's just saying, listen, if you, receive, if you receive the estimation that God has placed upon you, this is what it's going to look like in your own life. Now, a corollary of that is that if I do not feel that way towards others, then what can I conclude? That I have not received God's valuation of me. You will watch over and encourage them and your sympathy and confidence will make it hard for them to fall from their steadfastness. In this work, this is a glorious promise, in this work all the angels of heaven are willing to cooperate, are ready to cooperate. All the resources of heaven are at the command of those who are seeking to save the lost. Angels will help you to, teach, to reach the most careless and the most hardened. And when one is brought back to God, all heaven is made glad. Seraphs and cherubs touch their golden harps and sing praises to God and the Lamb for their mercy and loving kindness to the children of men. What a glorious picture that is of all of heaven rejoicing just as the parable of the lost sheep teaches us. That heaven rejoices when the lost has been found. That heaven rejoices when we are, are reaching out in acts of charity and love and service. And by the way, it's not an event, it's a lifestyle. Amen. It's not an event, it's a lifestyle. It's not a program, it's a lifestyle. We are to invest in these people just as Jesus has invested in us. Amen. Which is a long-term process. Which is a long-term process. By the way, here's a quotation I alluded to last night. Faith is not an opiate. Some of you, I think, were skeptical that this was a real quote. <laughs> I'm not going to say who. Faith is not an opiate, but a stimulant. Looking to Calvary will not quiet your soul into non-performance of duty but will create faith that will work purifying the soul from all selfishness. So the answer, the answer is to look to Calvary, to look there to see what my value is, to look there to see how much God has paid for me and that produces within my heart a motivation to go out and be who Jesus has been to me to place the same estimation on others that Jesus has placed upon me. And so it motivates me as Paul says, faith works by what? Love. Faith works by love. And so as I behold Jesus on Calvary, as I behold the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, it produces within me this motivation of love. Duty does become a delight. Now, as I said, there are moments where I don't want to do it because maybe I've had a bad night's sleep. Maybe I've had something wrong to eat. Whatever. There's many, there's many different reasons why. We're, so long as we're in this sinful, corrupt body, there will be the flesh pulling against my faith. And so, what I describe it is that there's kind of two different... There's two different uh, modes of faith to some extent. There's the mode of doing something as a delight that God changes my motives and God makes it a delight for me. And so as I, as I contemplate Calvary, I find myself naturally wanting to do those things that please God. But sometimes my, my attitude doesn't want to do that. And so it is at that time that I stand upon the promises of God and say, you know what? My feelings tell me something different, but I'm going to stand on God's Word. And, and that's largely how, how the book Lessons on Faith describes it. Jones and Wagner, largely in that book, I think talk about that second understanding of faith, that I'm going to stand upon the Word of God despite my feelings, 
But there will come a time, by God's grace, I don't have the quote here, I have it in my Bible. You know this quotation as well, Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, page 668. All true obedience comes from the heart, right? You've heard this before. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, He will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to His will, that when obeying Him, we shall be doing what? Anybody know? Carrying out our own impulses. Wow, could that ever become a reality? The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing His service. God is seeking by... He's doing it progressively where we are coming more and more into that experience where doing His will is our delight. But there will be times where it's not. Let's just be honest, okay? We can't, we can't sugarcoat it as though I'm always going to be just smiling from ear to ear that what God has asked me to do, I just always want to do it. And we need to stay balanced. We need to stay balanced because there are some people who make it sound like that's the way the life always is. That I never want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to grin my teeth and I'm going to bear it and I'm going to do it. But let's, so we need to be balanced. We need to be real about it though. And so it's at those moments, and we're going to look at a, a story here as we close in a second. Because you know what? Ellen White struggled with this. Did you know that? Ellen White struggled with this herself. She doesn't talk much about it that I've come across, but every once in a while, she will pull the curtain back on her own struggle with doubt and her own struggle with battling against her feelings. Let me show you that testimony. This is a letter and I know there are people who are much more... Um, you can't even see that, can you? That's alright. I don't feel like uh, pasting this into my whole PowerPoint on my iPad. So I'm just going to read it off. I put this on my blog. But um, this is actually a letter to Martha Bordeaux. And there's people here who could tell you a lot more about her than I could. But she was an interesting person because she actually was kind of at the crossroads of three different influential families with an Adventism. She was the younger sister, incidentally, of one George I. Butler. Ever heard of that individual? So we could do a whole psychoanalysis of the Butler family. We won't try that. But she was the younger sister of George I. Butler. She originally married the brother of Jane Andrews. He then passed away and she married A.C. Bordeaux. So the Bordeaux family, the, the Andrews family, and the, what was the first one I said? Butler. Butler, that's right. She was like at the intersection of all these families. But evidently, dear Martha really struggled with great despondency. And so Ellen felt a special burden to try to encourage her. And actually, this story, as we're going to read here in a second, it actually is the basis for something that Ellen Wright White's in Steps to Christ. So we're going to, if you'll bear with me, will you bear with me? We're going to read the bulk of the letter because it just speaks to my heart so much. And this was uh, in 1885, I think, that she writes this. It's an ongoing thing for Martha because there's another letter she writes to her, I think it was in 1887, where she's trying, Ellen is trying to encourage her again. Trying to encourage her again. So she says, My dear sister Martha, and I am skipping a few parts, a few paragraphs in the beginning. My mind goes to you, Martha, in Torre Palece, Italy. And I believe that yourself and husband should attend the meeting of the conference. I don't know which one it was. I'm sure, again, Ron or, or uh, Fred could tell you. She says, We want to see you, and we want to see you trusting fully in the precious Savior. He loves you. He gave his life for you because he valued your soul. Amen. I had a dream not long since. I was going through a garden, and you were by my side. You kept saying, look, look at this unsightly shrub 
shrub, this deformed tree, that poor stunted rose bush, this makes me feel bad. For they seem to represent my life and the relation I stand in before God. I thought a stately form walked just before us and he said, gather the roses and the lilies and the pinks and leave the thistles and unsightly shrubs and bruise not the soul that Christ has in his choice keeping. I awoke, I slept again and the same dream was repeated. And I awoke and slept and the third time it was repeated. Now I want you to consider this and put away your distrust. You're worrying, your fears. Look away from yourself to Jesus. Look away from your husband to Jesus. God has spoken to you words of encouragement. Grasp them, act upon them, walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Jesus holds his hand beneath you. Jesus will not suffer the enemy to overcome you. Amen. Jesus will give you the victory. He has the virtue. He has the righteousness. You may look to yourself to find it and may well despair in doing this because it is not there. Jesus has it. It is yours by faith because you love God and keep His commandments. Do not listen to Satan's lies, but recount God's promises. Gather the roses and the lilies and the pinks. Talk of the promises of God. Talk faith. Amen. Talk faith. Amen. Trust in God, for He is your only hope. Amen. He is my only hope. Now check this out. I have tremendous battles with Satan's temptations to discouragement. Amen. But I will not yield an inch, she says. I will not give Satan an advantage over my body or my mind. In another letter to her, just a few years later, she says, I hope I do not succumb to discouragement. I hope that I won't. I hope that I won't, she says. She goes on and says, If you look to yourself, you will see only weakness. There is no Savior there. You will find Jesus away from yourself. You must look and live. Look to Him who became sin for us, that we might be cleansed from sin and receive of Christ's righteousness. Now Martha, do not look to yourself, but away to Jesus. By the way, if you've not listened to or read some powerful presentations by Elder Bill Lehman, you need to do yourself a favor and listen to those, or, or read the book. He says, if we're just looking to ourselves, who are we becoming? Like. <laughs> We're becoming like ourselves and Satan more and more and more. That's why we need to keep our eyes firmly fixed upon Jesus because it is as beholding, by beholding, we become changed. She says, Martha, don't look to yourself. Talk of his love. Talk of his goodness. Talk of his power. For he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to bear. But in Christ is our righteousness. Amen. Jesus makes up our deficiencies because he sees we cannot do it ourselves. While praying for you, I see a soft light, light encompassing a hand stretched out to save you. God's words, check this out, are our credentials. Amen. We stand upon them. We love the truth. We love Jesus. Feelings are no evidence of God's displeasure. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Your life is precious in the sight of God. He has a work for you to do. It is not unfolded to you now, but just walk on trustingly without a single word because this would grieve the dear Jesus and show that you were afraid to trust Him. Lay your hand in His. He is reaching over the battlements of heaven for it to be laid confidingly in His. Oh, what love! What tender love! has Jesus manifested in our behalf. The Bible promises are the pinks and the roses and the lilies in the garden of the Lord. Amen. Oh, how many walk a dark path looking to the objectionable, 
unlovely things on either side of them, when a step higher are the flowers. Yes. They think they have no right to say they are children of God and lay hold on the promises set before them in the gospel because they do not have the evidence of their acceptance with God. They go through painful struggles, afflicting their souls, as did, as did Martin Luther, to cast himself upon Christ's righteousness. Elsewhere, just as a side note, she talks frequently about how we are not to demerit ourselves. That we are not to look upon ourselves in a lower estimation than God does. There are many who think they can come to Jesus only in the way the child did who was possessed of the demon that threw him down and tore him as he was being led to the Savior. You are not that kind that should have any such conflicts and trials. Richard Baxter was distressed because he did not have such agonizing, humiliating views of himself as he thought he ought to have, but this was explained to his satisfaction at last and peace came to his heart. There is no requirement for you to take on a burden for yourself, for you are Christ's property. He has you in His hand. His everlasting arms are about you. Your life now check this out. Your life has not been a life of sinfulness in the common acceptance of the term. You have a conscientious fear to do wrong, a principle in your heart to choose the right, and now you want to turn your face away from the briars and thorns to the flowers. Let the eye be fixed on the sun of righteousness. Do not make your dear, loving, heavenly Father a tyrant. But see his tenderness, his pity, his large, broad love, and his great compassion. His love exceeds that of a mother for her child. The mother may forget, yet will not forget thee, saith the Lord. Oh, my dear, Jesus wants you to trust him. May his blessing rest upon you in a rich measure is my earnest plea, my earnest prayer. You were born with an inheritance of discouragement. And you need constantly to be encouraging a hopeful state of feelings. Now again, here if we want to do a psychoanalysis of the Butler family, here we go. You received from both father and mother a peculiar conscientiousness and also inherited from your mother a disposition to what? Demerit self rather to ex than to exalt self. A word moves you while a heavy judgment only is sufficient to move another of a different temperament. Were you situated where you knew you were helping others, however hard the load, however taxing the labor, you would do everything with cheerfulness and distress yourself that you did nothing wrong. Samuel, who served, who served God from his childhood, needed a very different discipline than one who had set a stubborn, selfish will. Your childhood was not marked with grossness, although there were errors of humanity in it. The whole matter has been laid open before me. I know you far better than you know yourself. She's saying, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. God will help you triumph over Satan if you will simply trust Jesus to fight these stern battles that you are holy unable to fight in your infinite strength. You love Jesus and He loves you. Now patiently trust in Him, saying over and over, Lord, I am Thine. Amen. Cast yourself heartily on Christ. It is not joy that is evidence that you are a Christian. Praise the Lord. Amen. Your evidence is is in a thus saith the Lord. Amen. By faith I lay you, my dear sister, on the bosom of Jesus Christ. And she appeals to her at the end. And now we're going to have the benefit of having a piano player. Can we get a piano player up here? Yes. This is number, I think it's 489 in the hymnal. Maybe. Someone help me out. It's the song, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, because we're going to sing it here. Amen? She asks her to read the following lines. 
and appropriate the sentiment of your own as your own. Friends, let's sing this song together. Is it 489? Was I right? Let's sing this song together and let us appropriate these words as our own. Jesus, lover of my soul. Number 489. stand as we sing it. Jesus, lover of my soul, to pardon all my sin. Amen. Grace to pardon all my sin. Plenteous grace with thee is found. Let the healing streams abound. Do you need that healing? Amen. Do you need that healing? Yes. Why don't we have opportunity here to press together Amen. and go to the Lord in prayer Amen. so that we can receive that healing power, that pardoning grace that might spring within my heart and can rise to all eternity. Rise to all eternity. So why don't you find someone next to you, another person or two, 
And just as, as Ellen White says, appropriate this sentiment as your own. Appropriate this sentiment as your own. That you are a beloved son, a beloved daughter of God. So let's just take a few minutes to do that and then after a few moments I will pray. But let's do that at this time. Pray together. I want to be firmly planted in your arms so that I might widen that circle so that others can experience your love and value and acceptance. So Lord, may that be all of our experiences. You're looking for a people. You're looking for a people who widen that circuit of beneficence so that more and more still can be brought into that circle of love. Lord, we cannot proclaim your valuation of us if we do not live that valuation towards others. May they hear it, but more importantly, may they see it. I ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.